Hey folks, welcome to the Lady K Sailing mini series called Boat 101. Back in the Bahamas, we did a mini-series called Boat How To, and we got some really good feedback. So in this follow-up mini-series, we're talking all about boat basics. We're gonna use our experiences to answer the most common questions that we got asked and give you some inside insight into the boating basics from the Lady K Sailing team. In this episode of Boat 101, we're talking all about keels and anodes. And to do that, I'm taking you guys with me on a little field trip to an actual boatyard. We're gonna look at real boats on the hard, we're gonna look at what keels they have, and we're gonna talk about the differences between the keels so you can get an understanding of which one you may want and which one you may not. We're also gonna look at the anodes on those boats. We're gonna talk about anodes and what they do, the different materials for anodes and the different places you can put them. So stay tuned, this one's gonna be pretty cool. Hey guys, so the first thing we're going to talk about now that we're here at the boatyard is keels. And of course, this only really applies to sailboats. Uh, and a sailboat isn't a sailboat until it has a keel. Um, you may not have known that a, a sailboat's actual berth isn't when they lay up the hull, it's when they bolt the keel on. So, funny fact. Anyway, I'm going to be reading from my paper a little bit. I wrote down a bunch of things I wanted to say to you guys, so forgive me if I'm looking down a little bit here and there. Um, behind me, you'll notice we have a full keel sailboat, kind of a go-anywhere boat, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But a keel has two purposes. Number one, and that's the obvious purpose, is to keep the weight low and underwater. So when the wind hits the sails and the boat starts to heel, there's a whole bunch of weight on the other end counteracting the sails, making the boat stay upright and not flipping over. So everybody who's scared to go on a sailboat because it's going to flip upside down, they really don't do that under normal circumstances because they have this massive amount of weight under the waterline pretty cool. The other point of a keel that, I mean, is a little bit more obscure is the hydrodynamic effect that a keel has. So basically, as a keel travels through the water, it creates lift. And a fin keel is pretty notorious for this. Um, a full keel like the one behind me doesn't do it quite as much. But let's talk about that hydro hydrodynamic lift. So what happens when the wind pushes on the side of a sailboat is it'll try to push the sailboat sideways. And if a sailboat didn't have a keel, it would just go sideways the whole time instead of going forward. When you put a keel on it, it's harder for the boat to go sideways and it starts to want to go forward. Hence the reason we can sail almost upwind, we can sail side to the wind, and we can sail downwind traditionally. So a keel is as important as the sails are. Without the keel, you're not sailing. So the first keel I want to talk to you guys about is the one behind me. And as you can see, this is a full keel sailboat. Now what that means is that the keel runs from almost the bow, or at least forward of the mast, all the way to the back of the boat. There's a couple really big advantages for this. And first and foremost, and this is why these are kind of known as the go anywhere cruising boat, is that they're extremely comfortable. They're very good at taking weather because the keel is so heavy and there's so much of it. So if you're gonna be cruising anywhere, a full keel boat is something you may want to look at. Now, other advantages to the full keel is they tend to be a very shallow draft. You can see the one behind me is probably only about five foot draft, maybe five and a half. Uh, most of them tend to be four and a half or five foot and, and just they can really go anywhere. If you're going to the Bahamas or the Caribbean, the Turks and Caicos, you need something that you can get into the little anchorages with. And when we were in the Bahamas, we noticed a lot of these full keel boats going places that we just couldn't go because of the draft. So full keel, Shorter, much shallower, but much bigger and much heavier. Another advantage to having a full keel is it gives you a really convenient place to hide your propeller and your rudder from debris and you know tree trunks and different things that are floating around under the water. You can actually hang the rudder like this one is right off the back of the keel. And then the propeller's protected in an aperture, so it's not gonna hit anything either. Pretty cool. Now we talked about why the boat behind me, the full keel boat, is really, really a good thing if you're gonna be cruising around in shallow waters or really anywhere. But let's talk about why it might not be a good idea. And the number one problem with full keel boats is that they do tend to be slow compared to the other sailboats you're gonna be running with when you're out cruising. 
the slow comes from the fact that the keel is so long and so heavy, there's so much wetted surface, they just don't travel through the water as fast as their counterparts. That becomes a big problem when you're trying to run with a pack. The other problem with a full keel boat is maneuvering. They don't tend to turn up through the wind very quickly because the keel's so long. They also don't tend to dock very well or back up very well. So you do have to consider that with a full keel boat. There are those downsides. Next up, we're going to talk about the opposite of the full keel boat, and that is this one behind me, a fin keel boat. This is actually a CNC 24. It's a very capable, very fast boat for a 24 footer, but it does have a fin keel. And you'll notice that the fin keel tends to be much deeper and much skinnier. If we take a look, most of these fin keel boats draw about six feet of water. Some of the ocean going ones even draw seven feet, but because the keel is so narrow and so pointed, that they travel through the water and create that hydrodynamic lift that we talked about earlier so they can point up into the wind much higher than the full keel boat that we looked at a few minutes ago. Now, the maneuverability comes with that. They're easy to dock, they're easy to back up, they tack through the wind. Very, very, very capable boat when it comes to going fast and maneuvering and racing and things like that. But you won't see a lot of these in the Bahamas because they're so deep, they need more water. They tend to be six or seven feet deep. The other problem with them is they tend to heal more. You're not going to have as much weight in a fin keel, so they're not going to be as comfortable. They're not going to plow through the waves like the full keel boat or any of the other boats that we're going to talk about. And the other big issue with them is there's nowhere to hide the rudder and the propeller. The rudder ends up hanging off the back of the boat or behind the keel all by itself and is completely susceptible to hitting underwater debris, tree trunks, things like that. So before you take a full keel or a fin keel boat out to the Bahamas or the Caribbean, you really want to think it through um, and make sure the depth is there uh, and make sure that you're not too worried about the rudder post and things like that. But if you're going racing, there's nothing like a fin keel. Now we've looked at a full keel and we looked at a fin keel and you might be thinking there must be a compromise, um, sort of best of both worlds or maybe worst of both worlds. And for that, we're actually going to look at Lady K because Lady K has the in between the fin and the full. Some people call it a shoal draft. Some people call it a modified fin, but either way, the concept is this. You have a shallow fin that is a little bit longer than a normal fin. So you get the front to back length. Um, not quite as much as a full keel, but a little bit more than a fin. You also get the thinness of a fin keel, so you get a little bit better pointing. Now, it isn't as thin, it doesn't point quite as high as a fin keel, but it also isn't as long and as encumbering as a full keel. So it's maneuverable and fast, but not as maneuverable or as fast as a fin. But at the same time, it's not as stable or as heavy as a full keel. So you kind of have to, you know, Pick your battles, less of the lesser of all the evils, so to speak. Um, we had a lot of really good luck with a modified fin. Um, it only drafts about five feet, so we rarely hit bottom. And when we did, we were, you know, not in too much trouble. We were able to go just about anywhere in the Bahamas. A lot of places other boats weren't able to go. We were traveling with a 36 Catalina, and they had a six-foot fin keel. And we got into a lot of anchorages that they couldn't. And it's because of this keel. So that's the modified fin or the shoal draft. Uh, this boat actually came with a six foot version that was a fin. This is the shoal draft version, so five foot deep. Pretty cool. Now there's one more keel I wanna to talk to you guys about, and this is on newer boats um, that you'll actually start to see on the Hunters and the Benetos and things like that. And this is actually on a Hunter Legend 37, and it's just over here. We're gonna go have a peek at it. And it is called a fin with bulb. So it's just over here. Now you can see just the way this boat's sitting on the cradle, it doesn't actually draft very much water. I'm not sure what the exact metric is, but standing at the water line, I mean, the boat needs less water than I do. So looking at the keel, it's actually a fin, it's very narrow. So it's very narrow like a fin, but it has a bulb on the end. And the concept behind that is to add the weight that the full keel would provide you to make it more comfortable and more stable and, and sort of just more capable, but it really doesn't need very much water. So it's kind of like a full keel, but it's also kind of like a fin. And knowing all the boats in this particular place, I know that this one has the best PHRF rating of every boat here. It's actually the, on paper, the fastest boat out of every boat that's here. Uh, and I think a lot of that owes to this keel. It can also go just about anywhere because it doesn't need very much water. This is really cool. 
All right, guys, so we looked at keels. The next thing we're going to look at is anodes. And a lot of people call these zincs, but they're really called anodes. They just happen to be made out of zinc for a really long time. So basically what happens is when you put two dissimilar metals, meaning two different kinds of metal together and bolt them together and then immerse them in water, they'll be affected by galvanic corrosion. And galvanic corrosion can eat your prop or your prop shaft or your your stern drive or whatever it is. It, it can actually eat it quite quickly, especially in salt water. So the trick is when you put dissimilar metals together and submerge them in water, you put a softer metal, bolt it onto the whole arrangement, and the softer metal becomes the sacrificial metal. So the galvanic corrosion will eat the softer metal before it eats your expensive prop or prop shaft or what have you. Now, for a long time, that softer metal was zinc. But because zinc has some negative environmental impacts, people started using aluminum or magnesium. But before we get to aluminum, magnesium, and zinc, I want to explain and show you a little bit about what an anode is. So we're here at the Hunter Legend 37 that we were looking at earlier for its keel. And it has a really expensive prop, if you look. It's a bronze folding prop, which very, very good for sailing, very, very expensive. And then it has a stainless steel drive shaft right here. Now, if you look here, that's an anode or a zinc as they used to be called. Um, this one looks like it's probably actually still zinc. Um, but basically what it is, is you have stainless steel and you have bronze and they're together and immersed in water. So you don't want them to get eaten. And this is a great example because both are in very, very good shape because he has an anode and the anode is bolted on. It's a softer metal. So when something needs to get eaten by galvanic corrosion, that gets eaten first. And this one is actually pretty marred up. I mean, it maybe it should be replaced. You're supposed to replace them when, when they're at about 50% wear. Um, this one's not at 50% wear, but it is oxided over a little bit, so it might not work to its full potential. Uh, let's go see if we can find some other zincs. There's one next door here. It's a little bit different, but the same concept. You have the prop, the drive shaft, and the anode. Now, this is a good example. You're not supposed to paint these. They're supposed to remain without paint on them at all. The paint limits their ability to actually work. So don't paint your anode. Now, I'm going to take you guys over and show you Lady K's anode because it's a little bit different. Um, it's actually, she's got two anodes, but she's also got a sail drive. So it's not prop driven the way those two other boats were. So here she is. Now, you can see on Lady K, we have a sail drive and then we have a prop, and then we have an anode here, and an anode here. Now, this one is aluminum, and this one is aluminum, but you can see this one is eaten almost completely away, in pretty bad shape. Now, the reason for that is because she was in the water a long time. She was in salt water, brackish water, and fresh water, and she's done a ton of miles. Now, I have a new anode in the boat, I just haven't put it on yet, but that's about as bad as you'd ever want to see one before it actually stops being an anode and the galvanic corrosion starts eating your prop or your drive or what have you. So one more look at it. Pretty bad. Now, it's important to note that that anode needs to be in electrical contact with the metal you're trying to make sure is safe. You can't just hang an anode over the side of your boat on a string and, ex and expect the galvanic corrosion to attack it instead of your prop. The anode you're using to protect your prop and your shaft and your important stuff needs to be in electrical contact with the thing it's protecting. So most often you bolt it straight onto the shaft or onto the sail drive in this case. All right, let's talk about anode material. There's zinc, magnesium, and aluminum. Zinc was used for a long time, but as I said before, it has some sort of negative environmental impact. So we're really trying to get away from using zinc and people are really moving toward aluminum. Before we get to aluminum, let's talk about magnesium though. Now, magnesium is really, really good in fresh water, but it is no, no good at all in salt water or brackish water. So um, really magnesium doesn't get used that often. So let's move on to aluminum. Now, I wrote down some facts about aluminum, so I'm just going to read them to you. Now, aluminum is really good in salt water, it's pretty good in brackish water, and it's good in, in fresh water. Now, the problem with aluminum is that it oxides over fairly quickly, so you do have to keep your zinc clean. You want to be under the boat, scrubbing it, making sure it's not oxided over. Take a wire brush to it if you have to, just make sure that it is in good contact with the water and it's not all oxided over. So when you go to get your anode, you're probably going to end up with aluminum, and that's a good thing. If you're a freshwater sailor, check the anode 
you know, once a year. I mean, if you're a freshwater sailor, you're hauling out for winter anyway, so change it once a year if it needs to be changed. But you'll probably notice you can get two or three years out of an aluminum anode, provided there's no galvanic corrosion from an outside source, which we'll talk about in a second. If you're a saltwater sailor, and this is from personal experience, once every six months you should probably take a good hard look at the anode and probably end up changing it twice a year. Maybe once a year if you're lucky. The other place you get galvanic corrosion is if you're in a marina and there is a boat outputting electrical current into the water near your boat and you guys are both plugged into the same shore power circuit. You're creating a circuit between the two boats that connect, connects at one end via the shore power cables and at the other end via the water between your boats. So if you stay in a marina and you have questions about whether or not it's wired properly or whether or not all the neighbors boats are wired properly, take a look at your anode frequently. It will start to burn up very, very, very quickly if there's galvanic corrosion or stray current going through the water and you're making a circuit connection with another boat that's poorly wired in a poorly wired marina. There are testing apparatuses that most surveyors and most electricians can rig up to actually test. Somebody in this club actually rigged it up and tested for stray currents at the end of every single dock and we were lucky no boats outputting current and everything is wired correctly so ask your marina about that if you have questions all right guys that's it for this episode of boat 101 from lady k sailing these episodes are made possible of course by our patrons if you want to know how you can support lady k sailing and keep these episodes coming head on over to patreon.com forward slash lady k sailing as always, uh, we will have another video out every Friday. And if you want to see a different subject on Boat 101, go ahead and leave it in the comments down below. Look forward to seeing you guys again next Friday. Bye.